Gap Fiction Edition next month when author Brad Meltzer will be our guest on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg last week sat down to be interviewed at the annual Judge Thomas A. Flannery Lecture Series. This lasts about an hour. You know, our own Bryant Johnson is going to escort the justice to her seat, so you know how famous Bryant Johnson is these days. Welcome, Justice Ginsburg. I want to begin by welcoming you, welcoming you back to the very courtroom where, in your some 13 years on the DC Circuit, you heard 46 on bank cases. 46. Of those 46 cases, three, including one you wrote, went to the Supreme Court. All three were reversed. <laughs> and not only that, the opinion reversing yours was written by none other than your friend, Justice Stevens. <laughs> but that you're not, Chevron. pardon me? Chevron. No, it was a uh, warrant case. But fear not, it was a powerful dissent by Justice Marshall demonstrating that, as usual, the D.C. Circuit was correct. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Justice Ginsburg, when uh, Justice Scalia gave the uh, Flannery Lecture some eight years ago, he referred to Judge Flannery as a judge's judge. And I'd like to use that as our theme today and have a conversation with you about the art of judging. You want to say something about the judging? Yeah. David, I'm glad to have one of my favorite conversation partners um, with me. And I would just like to say a word about Judge Flannery. I had the privilege of knowing him when I was on the DC circuit. He was a prince of a man. He, you can't hear? How is this? Is that better? Well, Judge, Judge Flannery was universally respected by his colleagues and the lawyers who appeared before him. He once said, and I fervently believe, that without the confidence of the citizenry in the independence and integrity of our judicial system, our form of government could not continue to exist. I'd like to say a word about Justice O'Connor, who announced this week that she is no longer able to participate in public life. But she shared Judge Flannery's view of the importance of the independence and integrity of the judiciary. When she left the court, she launched a program called iCivics. This is a program designed to teach the core principles of civics to middle school and high school students. It has been amazingly successful. Uh, today, the program reaches half of the youth in our country. Uh, Justice O'Connor started iCivics because, in her own words, she said how vital it is for all citizens to understand our Constitution and our unique system of government. 
and to participate actively in their communities. It is this through this shared understanding of who we are that we can follow the approaches that have served us best over time, working collaboratively together in communities, in government to solve problems, putting country and the common good above party and self-interest, and holding our key governmental institutions accountable. To that statement, I can only say amen. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, <clears throat> before we get into judging, um, since your trainer, Brian Johnston, author of the RBG workout, <laughs> is with us today, I'd like to do a little fact checking. Yeah. How many total push ups do you do? Uh, where is Bryant? It's over here. Okay, so he will correct me if I slip. So we do to a total of 20 push ups, but we break after 10 so I can breathe a couple of times. How long do you hold a plank? I think it's 30 seconds and then again uh, a breath and then 30 seconds more. That, that's on the front. Side planks, I think, <laughs> are 15 seconds. <laughs> Last question. How many one-legged squats? Um, I'm going to call on Brian for the answer to that because I'm not quite sure. How many do we do? That would be two sets of ten, and great job with the answer, Justice. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> and let me say that Brian has been with me since 1999. Uh, I depend on him to keep me in shape. We started working together the year I had colorectal cancer. Um, when I finished surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, my husband said, you look like a survivor of a concentration camp. You must do something to build yourself up. So I inquired about a personal trainer. I met a few. And then Judge Kessler from this district court said, I know someone who is just right for you. And that's Brian Johnson. Um, so let's begin our discussion of judging by how you approach a case. Where do you begin? How do you get into the briefs and the record? How do you prepare for an oral argument? I generally start by reminding myself of, of what the court first thought about the case. So I will read the Poolnam memo and that was used by the justices in deciding whether or not to grant cert. So I'll begin with that. And then I will read the prior opinions in the case. Before I turn to any lawyer's brief, I want to know what the judges in the first and second instance decided. Then I will read a bench memo prepared by my law clerks. The objective of the bench memo is to enable me to speed read the briefs. I will personally read the briefs of the parties, uh, the briefs of our many friends, I have asked my clerks to put them in three piles. The largest, by far, says skip. <laughs> the middle one says skim. There is an interesting argument made at pages 15 to 19 of this brief. And then the rare, the very small number of briefs my clerks tell me to read. 
And then I will uh, check our precedent. My law clerks usually attach the most relevant cases in point. I will make some of my own notes on what I've read and questions. I will write out questions that I might ask at oral, at oral argument. But I want everyone in this audience to know that I start with the judges, not with the lawyers. <laughs> when, <clears throat> when in the process, or maybe it changes from case to case, but when in the process do you formulate your pretty solid view about the case, would you say? And generally, before I go on the bench for oral argument, that doesn't mean that my view is frozen in place. But after you've done all that reading, you are going to incline in favor of one side or the other. So I don't go on the bench with an empty mind. Mm -hmm. um, but I listen to the arguments and to what my colleagues I bring up. So it's not an empty mind, but neither is it a closed mind. Uh, Judge Flannery, in his oral history, said, quote, I am guided by the opinions of the Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeals. We have lots of judges here today, so I'm curious to know when you author an opinion for the court, who do you consider to be your primary audience? We judges on the inferior courts, the parties, the general public, history? Who are you writing for? Most immediate mm. audience, generally, mm. are other judges. Mm. The, they are the consumers of our products. So the consumers are judges and lawyers, and I try very hard to write an opinion that at least those consumers will understand. I generally begin with a kind of a press release opening, so the reporters uh, with tight deadlines can at least find out in the first one, two, or three paragraphs what the issue was, who won, and who lost, and basically the reason why. Um, I, I do labor over my opinions because I think clarity is very important, and it does take time to write it short. <laughs> um, you know, I mentioned <clears throat> all the on banks uh, that you were part of. I'm curious, when you look at a case f f uh, from one of the courts of appeals, does it make a difference that it was decided by a panel as opposed to an on-bank decision? Does that make a difference to the court? It's the decision of the court of appeals, whether it's a three-judge panel or on-bank. I can't say that I give more weight to an on-bank uh -huh. decision than to a three-judge panel. Yeah. Uh, slightly different topic. Observers have described your approach to judging as incrementalist. You've spoken out against judicial activism, and you've written that Roe versus Wade may have gone too far too fast. What did you mean by that? And are there recent examples of the court going too far too fast. Well, did you you describe my approach? Um, you mentioned judicial activism. How does one measure judicial activism? If activism means a readiness to overturn legislative products, then I think I must be one of the least active judges on the bench, think of legislation that has been overturned, campaign finance for one, 
uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act for another. I think if you, if you check my record, you would see that I am on, on the low side uh, on readiness to overturn legislative measures. Um, I think my position in Roe v. Wade has been been misunderstood. I tried to make it very clear that I would have voted for the judgment in that case. Texas had the most extreme law in the nation. Abortion was available only if necessary to save the woman's life. It didn't matter that her health might be disastrously affected. So that was the most extreme law in the nation, and the court could have said that, put down its pen. Instead, the opinion made every abortion law in the country unconstitutional, every restrictive law, even the most liberal states. And it gave the opponents of access to abortion a target that they could hit at. And it was kind of hard dispersing, um, fighting in the trenches state by state, but here was a Supreme Court decision. It was a target that that could be could be aimed at. So I never um, doubted the correctness of the judgment in Roe, but I did think that the giant step taken in that case was not appropriate. And com compare what happened what led up to Brown v. Board. Uh, Roe v. Wade, by the way, was the first access to abortion case to come before the court. Um, vastly unequal educational facilities had come before the court a number of times in, in cases where Marshall made it clear, Thurgood Marshall, that separate but equal was not before the court that day. The facilities offered were vastly um, unequal. So you can think of some of the building blocks for, for Roe. There was the McLaurin case. There was Sweat Against Painter, where Texas, when it realized it couldn't I have no accommodations for legal education for African Americans. It would set up a separate law school, a vastly inferior law school. So Sweat Against Painter was one, and I guess Missouri X Rail Gaines was the first. So it was only when all those building blocks were in place, each one was one. So I guess you'd call that incremental after those building blocks were in place. Uh, Marshall decided, yes, it was now time to say separate separation of the races forced by the state could never be equal. equal. How, much, um, how much of your views about uh, incrementalism have been shaped <clears throat> by your 25 years on the court as opposed to your own experience as a Supreme Court advocate in a series of women rights cases, which were also, in a way, produced incremental results? Or is it a bit of both? Yes, well, in that, I tried to copy Thurgood Marshall's technique uh. and <laughs> to bring to the court very likely winners, cases that... Um, I mean, and, and, and never, I never argue just the, this statute is unconstitutional. It was always how it affected the, the mm -hmm. person. So if you think of who was the plaintiff in Reed v. Reed, Reed in Frontier v. Richardson, right. in Weinberger v. Weisenfeld, these were all very sympathetic yeah. cases yeah. on the facts. Okay. So what did you 
What was your question, David? Well, the, the, <laughs> you, you pretty much answered it. I, I mean, I see your views about incrementalism evolving both from your experience as a litigator, but also I assume they've been shaped by your 25 years on the court, too. Yes, right? and I yeah. think you, you appreciate that when you're part of a collegial right. uh, bench, right. there is a strong tug toward the middle and away from extremes. Well, speaking of extremes, I have a couple questions about dissents, something you obviously know a lot about <clears throat> and that, frankly, I could use a little advice about. So, I think you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> so are there instances in which you disagreed with the court but nonetheless joined its opinion? Yes. <laughs> and... On the court, we call those dissents graveyard dissents. That is, we bury them. And it would, it, it could, it would most often occur in a statutory interpretation case. Uh -huh. Let's say a provision of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, Marty would not be pleased to hear me <laughs> say that, but, but or ERISA. One of the most confusing statutes Congress ever passed. Uh, these these are cases where a clear answer is needed, a rule of the road that lawyers can then adjust to and live by. As Brandeis said, some cases are better decided, no matter what is arguably right. They are just better decided. So yes, I have had graveyard dissents, and I think all of my colleagues have. Do you think your views about that, have, this is another question about your 25 years on the court, have, have your views about that evolved? I mean, like in your first few years, was it harder, uh, harder to accept uh, an opinion that you were uncomfortable with but nevertheless thought wasn't worth a dissent as compared to year, later years? I mean, is that something you've grown into? <clears throat> to accepting a decision that um, if, if it's a question of constitutional interpretation or an important question of statutory interpretation, and, and I think the decision um, will be productive of real harm, yeah. uh -huh. and then I will never bury it. Okay, yeah. So my second question about the sense uh, is this. Uh, last year, uh, when the court held that employers can use arbitration agreements to foreclose employee class actions, you read your vigorous dissent from the bench. Why did you pick that case? And generally, how do you decide which ones to read from the bench and which ones not to? Yeah, I read from the bench a summary of the, uh -huh. of the dissent. Right. And I do it when I think the court is not just wrong, but egregiously so. Mm -hmm. If it's a constitutional question, of course I'm speaking to a future court. But if it's a question of statutory interpretation, my immediate audience is Congress. And my favorite illustration of that is Lily Ledbetter's case the tagline of my opinion was, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error into which my colleagues have fallen. <laughs> and with overwhelming support of both sides of the aisle, in very short time after the court's decision, Congress passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Um, I have to say, personally, uh, Ruth, I was, I'm especially fond of the dissent you read from the bench in the Cheney task force case. Um, as you may remember, uh, I had written the decision for the D.C. Circuit that was reversed in that case. <laughs> and at uh, about 10.15 in the morning, on the day the court announced its opinion, I received a fax 
this shows you how long ago it was, it was a fax from you, and it said, David, I am reading this dissent from the bench right now. Signed, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> you made my day, I have to say. <laughs> um, uh, my next question is about precedent. Last term, in South Dakota against Wayfair, you joined an opinion that overruled precedent relating to the Dormant Commerce Clause. That same term, you joined Justice Kagan's dissent in Janus, in which she challenged the court's overruling of precedent relating to the ability of public sector unions to collect fees from non-members. When, in your view, is it proper for the court to overrule precedent? Uh, what a decision was wrong from the start, and the time, time has proved how wrong it was. So you mentioned um, South Dakota against Wayfair. That was mm -hmm. about an out-of-state seller uh, sending goods into another state could be required by the latter state to collect sales tax. And in the case called National Bell of Hess, the court said no, unless there is some kind of a physical uh, establishment in the receiving state, a warehouse, an office, a physical presence. But nowadays, it's so obvious that an out-of-state seller can put her wares before you and put her showroom before you in your living room, in your office. It's, and as a result of that, out-of-state sales have exploded because of the Internet. So I think the, the electronic age has made, made it inevitable that we would have to give up the right. notion that unless you have a physical presence in the state, you can't be made to collect sales tax. So National Bellis has, uh, the case that was overruled, was wrong from the beginning. Um, how wrong it was became more and more obvious mm -hmm. until it was intolerable, I think, to adhere to that, to that precedent. Um, the Janice case that you mentioned was quite something else. In that case, the precedent, Abood, I didn't think that was wrong from the start. I thought it was a reasonable compromise a Buddha held that people who don't want to join the union can be obliged to pay for the activities from which they benefit. That is, if the union is the exclusive collective bargaining agent, bargaining for wages will benefit all of the workers, so all workers have to contribute to that and similarly to the grievance procedure. Mm -hmm. But when the question was political spending, spending for political activities by the union, Abood said the, the union resistor is not required right. to pay for the union's political activities. A reasonable compromise it was working fairly well, um, so that it's quite different from a decision that was wrong from the start, working very badly. Yeah. So I don't think these, these two were mm -hmm. at all alike, and I felt very comfortable um, being with the majority that overruled mm -hmm. the, um, the sales tax case. And with the dissent uh, from a decision that uh, 
I thought reached a reasonable compromise and it was working working fairly well. I mean, so far, the Janet's case applies only to public sector unions. Right. And we shall see whether it spreads to the private sector. As you look back, have you seen, uh, have you detected sort of ebbs and flow in the court's willingness to overturn its precedent, precedents in the years you've been on the court? Do you, do you see any trends here? The court is always mindful <clears throat> of the importance of giving heavy weight to precedent. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I don't think the court has changed. You know, mm -hmm. in in, yeah. in that regard. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I want to ask you about something you've already mentioned, and that is uh, uh, collegiality on the court. Um, you know, we judges always we all talk about collegiality, but I'm interested in knowing what what do you think it actually means in the decision making process? How does it actually affect the quality of judging? It means you listen to your colleagues uh -huh. with respect. It means understanding that the institution for which you work yeah. is ever so much uh -huh. more important than the egos of the individuals that compose it uh -huh. at any particular time. Uh -huh. um, and if I can refer to Justice O'Connor again, she was a big promoter of collegiality uh -huh. uh, on, the, on the court. So, so the core to collegiality for you is listening, basically. Is that right? Listening to other views? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so I want to ask you uh, about something your dear friend Justice Scalia said um, when he spoke here. He blamed the Supreme Court itself for the polarization of the confirmation process. He said, the federal courts have become the place where social policy is made and moral disputes are resolved. That's why he thought the confirmation process has become so polarized. What effect do you think the court has had? What effect do you think the Supreme Court has had on the confirmation well, process? I disagree with my Wait. my dear colleague's uh, view. Thought so. <laughs> uh, and I have the, uh, I have the example of. Is this better now? Okay. Okay. Um, one of my present colleagues, Justice Breyer was counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee when I was appointed to the D.C. Circuit. Um, there was great rapport on that committee. Uh, Senator Edith Kennedy and Strom Thurmond uh, had a very good working relationship. And the, the hearings were not as they are today. Uh, they were not fiercely partisan. Um, the senators were working together to ensure that the federal judiciary would be of the quality that it has been for the most part throughout history. To me, the obvious culprit is Congress, that is, the polarization that exists, where votes divide on party lines, where there is no effort to reach across the aisle, and what a difference it was from the working relationship that Senators Kennedy and Strom Thurmond had in, in the late 70s and early 80s. Or compare um, the early 90s when Justice Breyer and I were appointed. Or the 80s when Justice Scalia was appointed. The, the vote for Justice Scalia was unanimous. 
The vote in favor of my confirmation was 96 to 3. That, despite the many years of my life when I was affiliated with the ACLU, not a single question was asked about that affiliation in my hearing. What a difference that time was from what we are witnessing today. Um, do, do you think the um, do you think the uh, court itself, especially in the past few years with its growing number of five four decisions that are often ideological, do you think that's contributing a bit to the polarization also of the confirmation process? Well, it's true that last year it was something close to 35 percent mm -hmm. of the decisions were five to four or five to three. Right. But look back just one year before that, only 15 percent mm -hmm. of the decisions uh, were five to four. So we will see how this term yeah. shapes up. We shall see. Um, so I want to completely change the subject for a minute here and ask about the increasing number of cases that require a high level of scientific and technological expertise. In one case, for example, the court considered the patentability of DNA sequences. And Justice Scalia declined to join part of the opinion because he said he was unable to affirm such details of molecular biology on his own knowledge. Do you, what, what do you think about the court these days about the court's ability to hear and decide these increasing number of technically and scientifically complex cases? The court is not deciding these questions in the first instance. The laboring or is held by the district court and the Court of Appeals. What the Supreme Court does is mainly it's, it's a checking function uh, to make sure that the case was properly adjudicated, to make sure that evidence wasn't admitted that should have been left out or excluded and it should have come in. Um, so the experience, I think, and with these questions of, of scientific information, uh -huh. um, I think the experience in the district courts and the Court of Appeals, they are the frontline adjudicators of those questions. It's interesting that we do have in the system one kind of specialized court, um, the Federal Circuit, that hears all patent appeals. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you about that. Uh -huh. But it turns out that we, and, and so, but it doesn't end with the specialized court. The, the, the Supreme Court reviews decisions of the Federal Circuit. And <clears throat> we have taken a fair number of cases from that circuit. So there is a general, generalist court making the last judgment in the case. Uh -huh. And if there was an expectation that the Federal Circuit would relieve not only the uh, regional courts of appeals from um, handling patent cases, that the Supreme Court will also, would also be spared. It hasn't, it hasn't turned out uh -huh. that way. Yeah. I take your point. Uh, about the Supreme Court uh, reviewing, uh, you're not uh, addressing these complex issues initially. They come to you from the district courts and the courts of appeals. But in recent years, uh, there have been an increasing number of amicus briefs that come direct to the court that offer fairly complex statistical and scientific information that hasn't come through the uh, lower court fact-finding process. That happened, for example, in the Texas Affirmative Action case where an amicus brief submitted a very complicated methodological approach to uh, uh, disproving uh, the affirmative action argument that was being argued there. And several members of the court 
uh, cited it in oral argument in their opinions. And so it, what, what do we do about that, about the fact that in increasing number of cases, this, a lot of this information is coming directly to the court without being through the rigorous fact-finding, cross-examination and fact-finding process. Do you think that's a problem? Um, you think we need to amend the rules so that amicus disclose what's new? Or, or is this just not a problem from where you sit? We, we decide a case on the basis of a record mm -hmm. that was made. And these, these briefs, um, my, my first encounter with it was when I was on the D.C. Circuit. In, in fact, it was my very first sitting. There was a dense environmental case, the usual... We three, still have those, by yeah, the way. <laughs> the three corners of the government agencies in the middle, the environmentalists on one side, right. industrialists on the other side. By the way, we like those cases because we know the court is very unlikely to take them. <laughs> well, this was a case about <laughs> lime scrubbers scrubbing dirty coal. <laughs> <laughs> And as we were laboring to understand the case, a professor sent us a copy, sent the panel a copy of the um, draft of a law review article, not yet <coughs> ready for publication. And the gist of it was, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You think carbon dioxide is the problem. Let me tell you, it's not. And then spelled, spelled it out in many pages. Particulates are the problem. That draft law review article eventually became a book um, with a title something like Clean Air and Dirty Coal. The, the court's decision was written by um, Judge Wald, and she pointed out very politely that there was not a word about this professor's theory in the record of the case. And so she was bound by that and could not uh, give, could not credit in, in the decision-making process the opinion of this, this professor. It has to be in the record. Yeah. Um, so most of those, mm -hmm. most, most uh, amicus briefs we receive are Me Too briefs. I don't know why they get written, maybe pressure from the client to have a, a brief in there. But a Me Too brief is not likely to be read by a justice. There is an occasional brief that contributes something uh, you mentioned the Fisher case, but I'm thinking of the Michigan affirmative action right. case. Mm -hmm. When a brief was yeah. submitted on behalf of the former <clears throat> superintendents of all the military academies, West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, and the gist of it was this. In the Vietnam War, enlisted men were overwhelmingly... the um, racial minorities. And the officer call was overwhelmingly uh, white. We cannot have another war in which there is that kind of separation of superior and inferior officers. That was a very impressive brief, that for the national security purposes, the composition of our armed forces had to change. So that, that was a brief that yeah. was credited. I always thought that brief, when I, when I read <clears throat> that brief, <clears throat> and then the opinion of the court, it reminded me of the amicus brief in Brown and the famous footnote where uh, Kenneth Clark's research about the 
adverse effects of segregation on African American children had such an impact on the court. Yeah, the two dolls. The two dolls, yeah, same thing. So you've been away for 25 years, but I want you to know we are still dealing with scrubbers and dirty coal. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't changed. <laughs> A more general question. Many of the court's actions affect our country and its institutions quite dramatically. I'm curious about the extent to which you follow the impact of the court's decisions. For example, you've already mentioned Shelby County against Holder, a case I know something about, where the court effectively nullified the Voting Rights Act's preclearance provisions. You authored a powerful dissent in which you warned that the decision cleared the way for the return of, of voter suppression. What do you think about your prognosis today? Now, sadly, I think what I predicted is exactly what has happened. Mm. Almost immediately, states enacted restrictions mm. uh, that never would have gotten through the pre-clearance process. Uh, I had pointed out in my dissent in Shelby County that in Shelby County, you remember what the issue was. It was many years since the Voting Rights Act was passed, 1965. Right. Uh, states or cities or counties that were discriminating in 1965 were not necessarily dis discriminating uh, when Shelby County came to us. So the majority said, Congress, you have to redraw the map of the districts that still have to be subjected to the preclearance process. Now, what senator or representative was going to stand up and say, my state or my county or my city still discriminates, so keep us under the restriction of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act had a way out. So if a state or a county or a city really got its act together and didn't try to suppress voting by certain voters, it could bail out. And that seemed to me a perfectly reasonable way of dealing with states, cities, counties that once discriminated but no longer do so. So he, who asked about my, about my prognosis, yes, I think what I predicted is exactly what has happened. Hmm. And I noticed uh, when I was rereading your dissent, which, by the way, I do regularly because it makes me feel better every time I read it. <laughs> yes, because, oh. <laughs> because you wrote for this court. Yeah. Um, I, I was intrigued with... You mentioned the Lily Ledbetter case where you called on Congress to fix a problem. And you didn't do that in your Shelby County dissent. And I, is that simply because of the point you made that yes. you just didn't see it as a practical yes. possibility that the states were not likely uh, to, to reenact the bill in any significant way? This, yeah. I mean, it's quite, it's quite it, it just struck me uh, uh, in these two powerful dissents that in one, you called on Congress. In fact, the, the majority opinion in Shelby County ends by saying, well, Congress can fix yes. a problem yes. if it wants. So yes. in a way, you were on <laughs> opposite sides there. OK. All right. Um, uh, so uh, another sort of related question. To what extent is the court generally, and you in particular, sensitive to social movements and change? I ask because in. In Obergefell, the gay marriage case, the court called attention to what it called the substantial cultural and political developments that led to a shift in public attitudes towards greater tolerance. How is this concern with social movements and public attitudes consistent with objective judging, especially given that members of the judiciary obviously have dramatically different views about social change and their meanings? <clears throat> a great constitutional law scholar, Paul Freund, 
when asked about whether the court should take account of social and economic uh, conditions prevailing in society, said the, the court should never respond to the weather of the day, uh -huh. but inevitably it will be affected by the climate of the era. The climate of the era. Think of Brown v. Board. We were fighting a war against odious racism, and yet for most of that war, our troops were rig rigidly separated by race. So the I think the, the experience in World War II hastened the Brown v. Board decision. I mean, how could we fight a war against racism and ourselves maintain uh, an racist a racist society. Um, I don't know, I'm not quite sure I understand your idea about um, objective judging, but I don't think any judge uh, today would tolerate laws that hold people back. Uh, from realizing their full human potential simply because of the color of their skin, their heritage, their gender. And in Elberkeveld, it was a different. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember the days when People who were suspected of being gay were not hired because they were not hired for government jobs because they would be a security risk. Someone could blackmail them uh, to gain state secrets because they were in the closet. What we saw were people, legions of people saying, I'm not going to stay in the closet. I'm going to come forward, say who I am, and explain why I am proud of it. And when that happened, unlike the racial situation, people looked around and who was in the gay community? My child's best friend, my colleague, so there wasn't the kind of we day that there has been with respect to race. I think that that accounts for Obergefell, that we saw our friends, people we loved, people we respected, uh, begin, become part of we rather than um, people who were who who were not um, embraced right. by the the dominant um, social group. Yeah. So it it really was that the the it was it was called the gay pride movement. Mm. There was so much uh, misunderstanding. My my first encounter with this was years ago. It was in the 1970s was when I was on the executive committee of the New York City Bar Association. And the Gay Activist Alliance said it wanted to have a program just to explain the difficulties they encountered renting an apartment, finding a dentist. I was on the post-admission legal education committee, and every program had to be sponsored, uh, attended to by one of the members of the committee. Well, no one volunteered uh, to 
be the host for the Gay Activist Alliance program. So, so I volunteered, and then there was some giggling around the table. Mm -hmm. Well, what's so funny about that? Well, Ruth, they might feel uncomfortable dealing with you. <laughs> what makes you think of all gay people, uh, male, who don't like women? In any case, the Gay Activist Alliance sent their vice president. She was a woman. <laughs> and it was a great, great program. And people uh, came to understand what they had been oblivious to before. Um, just a couple more quick questions. We're getting late here. Um, I want to ask you, uh, uh, five years ago, in this very courtroom, you participated in a historical society discussion with several other great women lawyers, including Pat Wald and Barbara Babcock. Although you celebrated that women judges have gone from uncommon curiosities to common occurrences, you have also said that there will be enough women justices on the Supreme Court when there are nine. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, what, 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 what do you see as the remaining institutional barriers to more women becoming judges? The same barriers that women encounter in other occupations. The overt sex-based classifications are, for the most part, gone. I mean, it was started with Myra, Myra Bradwell's case, which I think we were discussing at that at that meeting. So the law said women couldn't be lawyers. The law of Illinois later, a 1948 case in the Supreme Court, women couldn't be bartenders. In 1961, women could be exempted from serving on juries. Uh, all those laws that once riddled state and federal law books are gone. What remains, first, what has been called unconscious bias. And my best illustration of that is the symphony orchestra. In my growing up years, there was never a woman in the symphony orchestra, except perhaps the harpist. Taubman, the great critic from the New York Times, swore that he could tell the difference between a woman playing the piano or the violin and a man. Someone said, let's put you to the test. Let's blindfold you and see how you do. He was all mixed up. He heard a woman playing and said it was a man and other way around. So when the blindfold was taken off, he admitted that he had been operating with this unconscious bias. That is, he saw a woman so the expectation was lower than for a man. Well, the blindfold was such a good idea that it became the curtain that separates the people who are trying out for the orchestra and the people who are conducting the audition. And with that simple device, the drop curtain, almost overnight, the composition of symphony orchestras began to change. We can't duplicate the drop curtain in every field of human endeavor. I wish we can. I mean, so many women of my advanced age have the experience of being at a meeting, a problem is presented, and she answers, 
wouldn't this be a, a good solution? No response. Uh, four or five men then respond, and one repeats exactly her idea. <laughs> and people listen, and they say, good idea. <laughs> it's that perception that the, she's a woman, she's not going to say anything with heavy weight. There was, a, in fact, a Title VII case of that nature. It was against <coughs> TNT for not promoting women to middle management jobs. So the women did fine on all the standard uh, criteria until the very last one, which management called a total person test. The total person test was an interviewer and the candidate for promotion. Women dropped out disproportionately at that stage. And why? Well, the interviewer had a certain level of comfort when he was conversing with someone who looked like him. He knew, he understood what that person was like. But confronted with someone of a different race, or a different gender. He's kind of confused, he feels a little bit uneasy, and that uneasiness shows up in the rating that these people are given. So that, getting, getting rid of unconscious bias, one is to have people realize it exists and then try to guard against it. And the other major barrier is our workplaces don't account adequately for the demands of people with families. And that is beginning to change so that it is less burdensome, less stressful to both have a career and have a family life. And those, I would say, are the, the major hurdles for women who want to rise to the top of the tree today. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> last question. Given the composition of the Supreme Court, many have predicted rough seas ahead for issues like abortion, racial and gender equality, workers' rights. You've always been optimistic, assuring us that your colleagues are susceptible to persuasion and change. You still optimistic? I believe that as long as we live, we can learn. And I have some st stunning examples from the court on which I'm now sitting. Uh, in the days when our Chief Justice was a William H. Rehnquist. Now, in the 70s, when I was arguing before the court uh, that gender lines in the law th did not comply with the equal protection principle, I could count on then Justice Rehnquist to be in dissent. Just one of the, the decisions that Justice Rehnquist disliked was the Miranda decision. And now he's Chief Justice, and we are confronted, squarely confronted with, should Miranda be overruled? Despite his many criticisms of the opinion, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, no. Miranda stands. It has become part of the culture. And it happens to be working pretty well. So that's, or a man who said discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex. That was Justice Rehnquist. 
writes the decision upholding the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, and a case that was argued before the Supreme Court most ably by an, a now colleague of yours, uh, Judge Pillard. Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the opinion uh, upholding the Family Medical Leave Act. And when I brought it home and showed it to my husband, he read it and said, Ruth, did you ghostwrite that opinion? <laughs> so, as I said, as long as we live and listen, we can, we can learn. Justice Ginsburg, we're out of time. On behalf of the district court, thank you so much for sharing your views with us. You have given us renewed confidence in the integrity of the judicial process and the resilience of the rule of law. Thank you.